To be of good quality, you have to excuse yourself from the presence of shallow and callow-minded individuals. If that matters to you, clicking on this podcast was a mistake. What are you, 12? Welcome to another episode of What Are You 12? We are back for more 2011 movies, just chugging right along. With me today are my co-hosts, Emily. Hi, everyone. And Dylan. Hey, hey, y'all. And before we get started, thank you to everyone for listening. We do appreciate your support. If you haven't already done so, please like, rate, subscribe, or share us with a couple of your friends. We greatly appreciate anything you can do to help our, our podcast grow. Before we get into our movie that we watched this week, what's something you feel like a beginner at? I'm happy to go first on this one. Oh, let's hear it. Because you would not be surprised by this. I always feel like a beginner when it comes to land sports, whether it comes to actually watching it or hand-eye contact. Any sort of sports that doesn't revolve around being horizontal in water, I feel like a, such a beginner. And I can get through it and I can fake it, but I do not feel good about myself. <laughs> you are a very lanky, awkward person. And you'd think I'd be good at like, you know, running or cross country skiing or mm -hmm. something like that. But I have on many of my friends video and camera footage of me with my feet upside down in a tree with skis on my feet. Have you tried hallway swimming? <laughs> no, but I will go put my stomach on a swing and I will swim that way. Oh, there you go. I'm good at that. I'm very good at that. What am I, 12? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Dylan, what about you? Well, I, I think um, Emily might uh, kind of know it if I bring this up, but Lately, I've been reading a lot more manga in the last uh, year or so, and I have been talking Emily's ear off a bit, just looking for suggestions <laughs> and all this kind of stuff. And I, I always feel she must be so mad at me for keep asking questions. But uh, in the last couple of years, I've been uh, uh, or the last year, I've been reading it and I'm still feeling like a beginner when I hear about all this other stuff that's out there that I've not even heard of. Okay. Spend more time on Reddit, Dylan, if you're worried about bothering me. <laughs> There's so many subreddits out there for anime and manga. <laughs> you, you know, you could just say you, you're not bothering me. I do say that. Like, <laughs> okay. Every time he texts me and it's like, I'm sorry for being a burden on your life. Or something <laughs> ridiculous like that. Yep. And I'm like, Dylan, no. I must ask, acquiesce you a question. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I'm sorry, Dylan, every time you apologize for just being you, I get more annoyed. <laughs> just be you, please. We love you. Yeah. I'm a beginner at being me. <laughs> Actually, that's a really good segue to mine. Oh, shit. Oh. I feel like I'm a beginner at putting words to what I'm feeling. I don't feel like I was raised to have the emotional intelligence to, like, identify what I'm feeling in the moment and let other people know. Uh, so sometimes I do feel like a 12 year old who just feels first and then reacts in emotion before understanding like where that comes from. Is that why you taught seventh grade for so long? We got along really well for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> it's because I, I would see their their out emotional outbursts and I'd be like, oh, yeah, I get that. Like, I'm, I'm right there with you. But I'll, I'll get better. I'm a work in progress. Awesome. Well, I know that since Dylan brought up the fact that he's a beginner in manga, I know for a fact he probably hasn't read or seen this. And I know Ben's knowledge of anime and manga is not going to go this way. But have either of you seen, as I roll my eyes, The Vision of Escaflone? It's a 90s anime. No. You know, I remember the title because I had a friend of mine that was really into it and they tried to get me into it at that time. And I, I, I remember that wasn't that like one of like the original Toonami or something I like that. I think so, it was, yeah. Yeah. 
well, what the fuck is wrong with you guys? You need to watch this. Why aren't you watching this? You've told me nothing about it except the title. Like, <laughs> what am I supposed to watch? <laughs> okay, so The Vision of Escaflone is peak 90s anime. And so Dylan kind of gets that idea. Ben, you probably don't understand it at all. But not only is it very shonen and shoujo combined, it's a really good mashup of it. It's for girls and boys. It has giant mecha suits and space battles. It has a fantasy world. It has romance. It has comedy. It has all sorts of really great things in it. And what I especially love about it is that it doesn't back away from character trauma. Oh, is it cool. However, I found out in the United States released version of it in the 90s and probably early 2000s with Toonami, it was highly edited to just be a giant mecha battle anime and get rid of all the female characters and all of the gore. So find it on Crunchyroll or somewhere else because it is fucking dope as shit. It is great. I love it. And oh my God, the opening song is a banger. I just like dance with noodle arms every time I hear it. That's like every Japanese anime is like a banger of a song. Not always. Eh. One Piece goes (laughs) through my mind right now. Oh yeah, but One Piece is great. (laughs) Dylan, you might check that one out. I don't think I will be. Um. Oh, it's so good though. The character trauma, Ben. Here's one that uh, Ben and I might understand, a joke that Ben and I might understand, but uh, Emily won't. Uh, we'll have to go to Ben's house and uh, go full clockwork orange on him and tie him down to a chair and uh, force his eyes open and make him watch the show. I mean, of all the things you could do that for, I, don't let it be that. <laughs> don't let it be this one. Like, I just like him to finish Avatar. That'd be nice. She's given me so many things to watch that are way higher on the list than the one she just brought up. And that's no <laughs> offense to anything that she was just talking about, but... <laughs> I know my general wheelhouse of things that I enjoy, and that sounded a little outside of it. But thanks, Emily, for for that. There's Uh, political strife. Ooh. (laughs) It's like Game of Thrones in space. You're right. I'm in now. I'm in. You got me. Political strife (laughs) was all I needed to hear. Well, we were talking about beginners at the beginning of this episode, and that's because we watched Beginners, which is currently at 85% on Rotten Tomatoes. It won the Oscar and BAFTA for Best Supporting Actor for Christopher Plummer, making him at the time the oldest Oscar winner for acting in history. It was on roughly 15% of critics' top 10 lists for the year 2011. Has someone taken over now for the oldest actor? Anthony Hopkins won in 2020 for The Father, and he was a year older than Christopher Plummer. This is 2003. This is what the sun looks like and the stars... This is the president, and this is the sun in 1955, and the stars, and the president. My parents got married in 1955. They had a child, and they stayed married for 44 years until my mother died. Six months later, my father told me he was gay. I'm gay. I remember him wearing a purple sweater when he told me this, but actually he wore a robe. I'm gay. He was gay the whole time they were married. This movie is written and directed by Mike Mills, who has a background in graphic design and directed short films and music videos before making his feature debut with Thumbsucker. Beginners <laughs> is partly autobiographical, since Mills' father also began a gay relationship after the death of his wife. Partly autobiographical. It feels very autobiographical. All I could find is that part of it was related to his life. I didn't know any... <laughs> so I, I think the... Uh, I don't know if the female character in that relationship is oh, I have part no idea. that's not biographical. Mm-hmm. Starring in this movie is Ewan McGregor, who began his career in TV before breaking out with his role in Train Spotting in 1996. He gained megastardom in 1999, starring as Obi Wan Kenobi in the Star Wars prequels, leading to roles in Moulin Rouge, Big Fish, The Island, and his greatest role to date, Robots. Yes. Yep. I didn't feel enough enthusiasm from Dylan there on robots. That's too bad. (laughs) Sounds like we got to watch it. Dylan, have you seen robots? I have. Yeah. Okay. I I wasn't sure if we needed to have an educating Dylan episode about robots. (laughs) I'm aware of it. I've seen it once and I was like, all right, there we go. That's a movie. (laughs) (laughs) Loosely termed. Yes, that's a movie. 
as we said, Christopher Plummer was nominated for the Oscar for this movie and won. Prior to this, he appeared in many TV shows in the 1950s, but is most known for playing Captain Von Trapp in The Sound of Music. He received his first Oscar nomination in 2009 at the age of 80 for his role in The Last Station. He steadily found acting work for over 66 years before passing away in 2021. And last person we'll call out is Melanie Loren, who starred in Mostly French Fair until her breakout role in 2009 in Inglorious Bastards. And in fact, she understood or spoke no English until the filming of that movie. So even this two years later, she's still a a relatively new English speaker. And does really, really well, not just like in the movie, but just seeing other interviews and stuff. Mm -hmm. Great. Just amazing. Also, she writes and directs stuff, which is really cool cool too. So her and Mike talked a lot about like writing and directing. That's cool. I didn't know that. Thanks, Emily. Mm -hmm. Emily, you had not seen this movie. Had any of us seen this movie? I had not. No. Okay. Yeah. First timers for all of us. Yeah. What did you think this movie was about, Emily? Well, when you had brought this up to our conclusion to 2010, I got really excited hearing Ewan McGregor and Christopher Plummer. That pairing just seemed, I didn't really know what to expect. So Mm -hmm. I decided to go with something kind of broad. Two widowers decide to take tap dancing classes and bond over their losses. Oh, I really like that. I would really want to see that because Christopher Plummer, like I was thinking from Sound of Music, Ewan McGregor, I was thinking not only his choreography and Star Wars abilities, but also (laughs) Moulin Rouge. (laughs) I was just like, they would have the most amazing epic dancing together. And do they end up finding love with each other? I mean, I guess. Or is the love they find with Tap? I did originally think that like maybe the two of them would fall for each other i did not like i was more like a throwaway like oh maybe they fall in love even though they're super far apart in age and then it turns out that's like a thing in this movie so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well dylan based on the dvd cover what is this movie actually about when graphic designer oliver meets free-spirited anna shortly after his father has passed away Oliver realizes just how much of a beginner he is when it comes to long-lasting romantic love. Memories of his father who, following the death of his wife of 45 years, came out of the closet at the age of 75 to live a full, energized, and wonderfully tumultuous gay life. Encouraging Oliver to open himself up to the potential of a true relationship. With none of us having seen this movie, I think we got to just start off with first impressions. What'd you guys think? Oh, my first viewing of this, and I went back and watched pieces of it because I wanted to, but those opening shots and fast cuts, my first note down was, is this movie about dementia? And then I typed, is this a dead dad story? And then it's revealed like five seconds later. And I was like, oh, God. (laughs) Yeah. I'm in for a ride of sadness, but I don't know. I didn't really, I mean, I had tears. I cried a lot in this movie, but it had such a great vibe to it. Very heartfelt and cozy. And so like I was immediately enraptured with what was happening even though it didn't feel like anything big was happening. It just felt like a human story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of what my first viewing was also. I I called it beautifully melancholic because it it, it had like this underpinning of sadness, but also it was it was being filmed and shown in this almost whimsical way that it it, it didn't allow you to like really fall into the, the sadness deeply like it it was always like oh there's there's clearly hope in what in what's being presented here it's it's not like let's just talk about my dead dad and feel bad uh it's not a, it's not a sorrow fest dylan tell me your, your first thoughts on the movie my first thoughts was well i'll say after watching the movie that it was fantastic i i really enjoyed it but my initial beginning thoughts was uh when emily was descri- what she described in the beginning i kind of was like Okay, is 
did this guy learn or watch a lot of Wes Anderson movies? Because a <laughs> lot of those first like shots, I was like, this feels Wes Anderson. But then it it goes away from that it completely. But it just kind of had that, you know, every shot was just kind of like a still boom shot. And granted, a lot of them were pictures, but some of them weren't pictures. Some of them were pe- live people. So that was my initial first thought. But uh, yeah, I, I really enjoyed this movie. Yeah, I know. I could see the Wes Anderson um, framing for sure. I felt the color palette was off. And so I actually felt a little bit more like 500 Days of Summer or even Amelie. And Amelie, of course, again, different color palette. But those were the first two kind of thoughts that went through my head because it did feel familiar as I was watching this. Yes. But in a refreshing way, it didn't feel like oh, pigeonholed Wes Anderson movie. It felt reminiscent of something, but still fresh. 100% agree with that. It didn't feel stale or old or or copying at all. It felt to me very much like a narrative documentary. Because Ooh, yeah. everything presented, it, it was all very straightforward, especially with like the presentation of the stills. And this is what it was like in 1955. This is 2003. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't I didn't really ever get the Wes Anderson feel because Wes Anderson always feels like it exists on an earth that's not ours because everything oh. is so vibrant <laughs> and the characters are so big. This very True. much felt lived in like a documentary, like people that I could actually run into on the street and meet. Like it felt very real to me. Mm-hmm. I, I can see that, too. I, I see. I'm just mostly going with like the editing type. And like how it was kind of filmed and edited those like very quick boom, 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 which felt like the very beginnings of a Wes Anderson movie when he's kind of introducing some of the characters and everything. It kind of had that fast movement motion to it. And he's establishing the scene by cutting to like a variety of objects being listed off. I I definitely understand what you're talking about, about that editing style. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it, it is a common thing in, I would say indie movies <laughs> you know yes i and that's kind of when i was first thinking about it i was like this is so familiar to me and later in the movie i was like oh this is very 500 days of summer from what i remember especially when you and mcgregor's character started talking about the woman um anna or anna shit i don't remember <laughs> i know we all like 500 days of summer in in this podcast that are here right now I feel like 500 Days of Summer has a level of pretentiousness that this one never gets close to approaching. Do you, would you guys agree with that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But I would also say maybe that's because the subject matter of 500 Days of Summer with the ages of the main characters kind of had that, you know, that maybe kind of that age group has a little bit of pretentiousness to them in like character wise while we're dealing with um in this mo- in this film Ewan McGregor is generation X and his father is World War 2 or um yeah. Korea that that age group in there and i thought that that makes it feel different more down to earth because of like the idea that Christopher Plummer is part of the greatest generation that type of th- you know that type of thing i think it's partially the subject matter but it's also just the way that it was shot and the story of the characters themselves and also just the ambiance. I'm thinking about especially the music and the places that they were living. They they were in LA as well, right? It was yeah. maybe shit. I can't remember. 500 days of summer was in LA, right? Yes, it was. Yeah. But it was in a location where, like you said before, it is very lived in. And the music choices, it's, it's this jazzy, timeless feel to it where it's not like indie pop culture. Well, I would also, I would say, yeah, it, it made L.A. look and feel like a lived in uh, city, not glitzy or glamorous or, or anything like that. Like uh, two examples I can think of when they go to the taco stand, true people from Los Angeles would know what that is, not, you know, a touristy type person. Plus, I also think about the comparison of um, the Manic Pixie Dream Girl aspect of it. You know, Zoe Deschanel's character is attributed to being like this Manic Pixie Dream Girl. 
even though like that's not the point she is her own person and tom like projects this image of her of being this perfect perfect thing versus the female character in this the romantic lead she is her own character and you see that right away so there is that depth and i i, I love that do you think that under the circumstances of christopher Plummer living for 50 60 years because he felt like he had some sort of obligation to live a certain way. Like, do you feel like you can call that a life well lived? Getting fucking deep. Oh, Oh, we're going there. Um, Yeah. (laughs) So this is taking place in 2003. George Bush is president. Um, We have a completely different world where we're still like, extremely in the early 2000s with a lot of homophobic natures i mean there's still a lot of homophobia out there but like this is a common theme in like the 90s and the 80s and prior to that of men and women not living as themselves and thinking that that is the right thing to do whether it's through safety or through just convenience or because you want to find love in a companionship manner and the risks do not outweigh the reward. So I think in this case, because of, again, safety and also because of the risks being so high for um, LGBTQ people in like 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, even early 2000s, like it was not safe. And so, and we still are having issues, but people can at least be open about it. Like it it is such a common story that I think once his wife passes in the movie, he kind of realizes that he can just do what he wants. He doesn't care. He's fucking 75. (laughs) Mm -hmm. For me, this kind of part hit a, a soft spot for me because one of my um, mother's best, actually like her best friend growing up through high school and everything was gay. And this was again in the seventies and he was very closeted and he actually did marry at one point, you know, and it was more a marriage of convenience than it was a marriage of, of love or anything like that. And it, the first thing I thought of when, when that happened is I went how many hundreds of thousands, if not millions of, gay men and women had to live that type of a life where they had to live completely shadowed all the way up till you know 80s or 90s because uh, my mom's friend he worked at the ford plant when ford was still building cars here in saint paul and they actually had it in their union that if they found out your sexual orientation you could have been fired that you know you could have been fired from your job for just saying yeah i'm gay So even in your workplace, you had to be completely, you know, silent about it. And that hit me really hard with with that. And um, do I think it was a well life lived? I agree with Emily that it is a well life lived uh, because of what he had to do. They gave an example in the movie. You know, they showed a picture of a bathroom stall and he said, this is where my dad said, you know, you could... uh, have sex in a bathroom, but if you got caught, your life was ruined mm-hmm. basically in his time period. So it had to be a marriage of convenience and of love and everything. But um, yeah, I think it was a well lived life deserved. I wanted to add that it's also kind of the only way that someone could have a family. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think that even though this movie doesn't really show how Christopher Plummer's character treated Oliver when he was young and when he was a kid, it still like ha- you you could see as he was older, as Hal was older, you could see the love that he had for his son. So it's a complex question, has a lot of d- different nuances. What do you think, Ben? I mean, I, I struggle with that question, and that's why I wanted to pose it to you guys and kind of hear your thoughts, and I appreciate all the things you said. 
in the absence of any other way of existing, I can understand why a choice would be made for that. But at the same time, in thinking of the way the way things are now and my own privilege, like I've always been able to make my own choices and live the life that I've wanted to live. Yeah, white male privilege. <laughs> sorry. Acknowledged, you know. <laughs> it was getting so heavy, Ben. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you're you're right. And and specifically, you know, straight white male privilege, because obviously Christopher Plummer is a white male too. But yeah, I I just found it very interesting the way it was presented. And the other topic I want to talk about is this idea of historical consciousness that kind of runs through the movie. Um it's it's something that Ewan McGregor first brings up when he's doing graffiti for the first time with his friend and he writes on there like a, a year and then something about George Bush. Yeah. And then he's like, well, well why did you do that? And he's like, well, historical consciousness. And <laughs> what that deals with is people's understanding of the relation between the past, the present and the future. And I feel like this movie does a really phenomenal job of kind of acknowledging that idea and then showing a way that it it kind of correlates between all those segments. With that said, how do you feel like Oliver looking back on his father's way of living affected his choices in the end of the movie? Do you mean as a whole or more like at the end of his life or both? I'm talking more, well, uh, as a whole, because he flashes back to when he's still married to his wife, Hal, and he flashes to his time with, I think it's Andy when um after he's he's come out and th this movie and it's one thing i love about it is it, it doesn't really give you a lot to work with it, it makes you do a lot of the legwork of figuring out what's going on between these characters there are things shown that aren't given immediate meaning like with the coins and the flashing mm -hmm. in yeah. that scene where you really have to stop and think about like okay what do those images have to do with what's being talked about so I, I'm just asking you guys, like, what did you get and how do you think Oliver applied what he learned from his dad to his relationship with Anna and the choices he makes? I would say that he learned from his father about maybe lack of communication, lack of affection um, towards people, because, you know, he saw every time he kissed his wife goodbye. It was very not loving. You know, it seemed like a, a going through the motions uh, moment. But with Andy, you could really see that there was affection when they when they did that. And I think that Oliver learned that most of his life that, you know, the woman is just meant to kind of be there and you're not supposed to give them any attention or something, or, you know, that they're just going to be there. Because he also references that every relationship he was in, he's the one who ruined it. And he acknowledges that. So maybe he sees that. That's how I learned that from my father. I learned how to ruin relationships or just not to have a good one in life. To you know, because he didn't see a good one. He didn't grow up with a good one. Oh, I don't I don't know about I don't know about that. So if if we're talking about the way that Oliver internalizes it like we very much see oliver reflecting on his father and his mother's relationship after his father's died like that that's what i always felt like like the, the stuff with anna is when he's doing all these reflecting oh, and yeah. throwing back by this point he has seen his father with andy so i don't think when oliver was in those other relationships he was necessarily like oh i never had a good model for a good relationship i think he maybe thought his parents had a good relationship and then he's reevaluating it now, knowing, OK, actually, my father was gay the whole time. What, what did mm -hmm. I miss in the moment? And how can I take maybe the things that my father was unable to to do and live and apply it to my own life to live my best life? Because this is very much a midlife crisis movie. Yeah, I also think that as you're talking, I think fundamentally, I don't think that people need to ha see like the perfect or a good relationship in their life in order to have good relationships with people. And I think just thinking back to Oliver growing up with his mom and just like the silly games that they did, just brief instances of her personality. And I know that there was a moment where he had to like walk her out 
of the art museum or something. But, you know, there there was conflict there, but at the same time, there was still love. And we didn't get to see a lot of it, like Ben said, and you have to kind of fill in the gaps. But I don't think that I would blame his father or his parents' relationship for his failed relationships. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's I, taking the easy route. I, w- I wouldn't be saying I'm putting blame there either. I'm not putting blame on his. It's it's I would say it's kind of a nature versus nurture that, you know, you learn things from what you see. And that doesn't necessarily mean I'm blaming the parents at all. It's just that's what he grew up seeing. And that's what he just came to. And because he doesn't once at all throughout the whole movie blame his dad for really anything they never show you know if that happened so i'm not saying that at all that um he's blaming his mother and his father for it it's just well this is what i saw so this is what i know yeah right and i'm saying that that's that to me fundamentally i don't feel like that is an excuse i feel like that that is his excuse but that's not reality And I'm coming from it where I don't feel like that is his excuse because I don't even feel like he was internalizing his parents' relationship negatively at the time. It was just normal. It was just, it was just what is what it was. And then him on Mm -hmm. retrospect, looking back after his father's passed away, then he starts to see the cracks and and redefine what it was that he was looking at. Mm -hmm. I wanted to also bring up, I know this is kind of tangential, (laughs) Um, the director, as Ben said, this is this is a partially autobiographical story. I would encourage anyone that watches this movie to watch the 14 minute documentary on YouTube, the making of this movie. It is done in a very wholesome and down to earth manner. It is really done from the perspective of Mike, whatever Mills, is that his Mm -hmm. name? Mm -hmm. And he kind of walks you through how he thought about this process and just kind of his own reflective nature of it. He even shows off his dog and he's like, this is the inspiration for Arthur. She's great. Like she's just lazy and bored and talking at me. And I also really just enjoyed the fact that it was done in all black and white, so it did have this kind of timeless feel to it. it. It just was really delightful to partner on to this movie. So if you haven't watched it, you need to watch it. Well, I will have to do that right after this. Mm-hmm. Let's get into the, the the critiquing of this movie. But before we do that, our eternal optimist on this podcast, Dylan, he's got something for us today that maybe he's not too optimistic about. Hater's gonna hate, and ainer's gonna ain't. Took me a little while to think of it, I'll admit, but I came up with something. I did not like in this movie the fact that on every website, it's listed as a drama comedy. I didn't laugh once during this movie, and I think the place that they tried to make me laugh was during the scenes when they were committing vandalism. and. I thought the music score was god awful during those scenes. No, 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 no. I thought no, it was no. brash, annoying, and just dumb. Uh, it felt like it was trying to be more goofy and zany than what it really was at the time. And frankly, if they were going to do this, then just play the theme from Curb Your Enthusiasm or the <laughs> song Yakety Sax from the Come Benny on. Hill uh, show, the. that's what it felt like to me they showed this movie to audiences they didn't like it and so then they they mike mills was like well there's supposed to be something funny here this is funny and no one thought it was funny so they put in this (laughs) god-awful whatever it was uh sequence of music in with those scenes of vandalism and i'm sorry it was bad it was just bad what a fucking bitch am i right (laughs) dylan i am so proud of you for hating on the movie for just a second like i'm so proud of you found something 
my only concern is that I typed in beginners. The first thing that pops up is drama slash romance. <laughs> no, I swear to God, if you go on Wikipedia, <laughs> on IMDb, you will see like drama, romance, comedy, or you'll see drama comedy. This movie's labeled as a dramedy, as a drama comedy. This is really funny. <laughs> and it is not. I don't no, that's bull. That's bullshit. That's all bullshit. <laughs> I just showed it to him. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. I also find it very surprising you didn't laugh like at all because I a hundred percent laughed many a time, but it wasn't like a ha ha, this is so funny. It was like a ha, ha, that's good. Yeah, I guess that's my when I interpret something as supposed to be a comedy, that it's gonna have more scenes of actual like ha ha laughter rather than just going, huh, that's funny. Dylan, I can't believe that you didn't find some of these things funny because, like, the dog. We need to talk about the dog. Yes. <laughs> like, <laughs> I th I think it's very sweet. I'm very proud of you that you tore this movie a new one. But there have to be some parts that made you smile because of this dog. First off, this dog had such an amazing presence on film it was mm -hmm. just so dog-like but also humanoid it, it was it was did such a phenomenal job acting but when the dog first said something with the subtitles mm -hmm. i fucking flipped out did anyone else just completely laugh when he was like well i understand up to 150 words dot 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 i don't talk <laughs> absolutely yeah i thought i thought that was just like where are they going with it? I was like, that's interesting. Where are they going with this? With the Man, with Dylan, this whole thing. I, I know we asked you to find something that you didn't like, but good God, are you dead inside? Oh no. <laughs> oh, I like you know no no no. <laughs> Near the end, I love the dog. I like the dog. I at, at first wanted my rant okay. to be about that it was a Jack Russell Terrier. But eventually I was like, God <laughs> ah, damn it, I love Jack Russell Terriers. <laughs> but like the the dog getting a tour of the house you and mcgregor just walking yes. around with this dog following him around all of the dog's lines are amazing you know we knew it wouldn't work even before we met her are we married yet it's just like this super funny narration that oliver is adding on and i think my favorite entire part about the dog happens during when oliver and him are at the dog park and Arthur's just sitting on the bench with him while Oliver goes into this long monologue about how you need to go and have your own experiences with your own people. He's like, go be free. Stop hanging out with me. And it was just so fucking awesome. Not only does the dog provide the comic parts of this movie, but the two moments that hit me the hardest were both things related to the dog also, like emotionally. The scene where Arthur mistakes the neighbor for Hal and he like runs up to him because he thinks it's oh, him. Oh, I know. my heart broke there. And then when Oliver drops him off with Andy and Andy very excitedly says, he remembers he me. Remembers me. That's yeah, why I, I started like, crying. I like, that. For sure. I like that part. I like that part. Yeah. But dogs do that. And I, I know like when you have dogs in movies versus like a dog movie, you know, dog movies, the dog's going to die. But this, this was a perfect amount of heart wrenching emotions but also comic relief and cuteness mm -hmm. i i thought it was cute but i guess i guess how i was how i was kind of reading the dog talking to him was maybe not necessarily comedy but more kind of like the dog kind of being lonely and depressed you know how it kept saying like are we married yet and i was just kind of like okay is this because <laughs> the dog wants more companionship because he kind of looks because every shot of the dog he looked like sad he looked like he's still mourning for for hal have you seen my dog he is so good at looking so malnourished and depressed and sad so that you will give him love <laughs> your dog looks like he listens to my chemical romance <laughs> he even has like eyeliner around yeah. his eyes <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> little dashboard confessional too mm -hmm. <laughs> i think we need to talk about the script this film had so many lines that resonated with me 
there's two that I want to call out, though. The first one was something that Oliver says. He says, our good fortune allowed us to feel sadness our parents didn't have time for. And that caused Oof. me to just reflect for like over an hour on on that. And just, again, the idea of historical consciousness and how, you know, the, the past and present are connected. And I fell down a, just a deep rabbit hole thinking about that one. And then the exchange where Hal says uh, he's talking about when you were little, you always dreamed of someday getting a lion and you wait and you wait and the lion doesn't mm -hmm. come. Then along comes a giraffe and you can be alone or you can be with the giraffe. Yep. And then Oliver says, well, I'd wait for the lion. And then Hal says, that's why I, I worry about you. That's just it was such a powerful uh, mm -hmm. discussion that just perfectly encapsulates the entire movie for me. Just in those like that little piece of dialogue. Yeah. And I, I think back to a lot of those different moments. And I think, yes, the dialogue stuck out to me, but it was more about the pacing of it all and how it tied yes. together, how you, it yep. would jump around in, in a certain way uh, where you, you knew that his dad had died. You knew that he had met Anna after his dad had died, especially, you know, they're having that conversation um, about their parents being dead. Um, but also like it would jump back to show his childhood occasionally. And, and then you'd have those little snapshots of this is 2003 or this is, I felt like the way that the story was put together, it worked so well. And I, I'm almost positive that this movie was filmed chronologically pretty much. Yeah. And so when you think about that, it's like, I don't know, it's just Mike Mills had such a solidified idea in his head of what he wanted this film to look 100%. like and feel like. Mm -hmm. And even when I was watching this documentary, Christopher Plummer talked about how the director came in and he he's like, I'm so jealous of him because he's so young and he's acting like those old professional people that know exactly what they want. And he knows and it, it does work well. And so I agree. The writing, the script, even just how the direction feels mm -hmm. beautiful. I liked the small written callbacks or you know how we were talking about what Oliver learned as a child with relationships, how he picked up a lot of the little things that his dad did, you know, and the big one for me was the house when he'd say, hello house. Hello, Hal. Hello, Oliver. That Oliver did the exact same thing, but you don't do it until later. Yes. Mm -hmm. But I, but I like that because I think that reflect that, that, meant a lot because I imagine all of us have something that we've kind of picked up from our parents over the years, little quirks, oh, yeah. little things that they do and the, how that carries over. And it almost makes me kind of wonder what's, what's going to happen with my kids and what's going to carry over, you know, from what I've done with them and then what they hear from me. And that, that mirroring of events and idiosyncrasies throughout this movie ties so well into this idea of historical consciousness, first of all, but then also like it extends beyond just what Oliver learned from Hal. Like you see the, the dog tour that Oliver gives at the beginning of the movie. And then Anna gives Oliver a very similar tour of her apartment at the end. There's Anna and Oliver's mom both pretend to kill Oliver, like just a very weird <laughs> thing that somehow ties these characters mm -hmm. together. And it's just f fascinating to me the way that the script is able to flow between these seemingly disconnected scenes across time to create this cohesive movie that builds as it goes until it gives you the emotional release at the end, even though you know the emotional release is coming. We know Hal dies, and it still hits you like a ton of bricks when you see Oliver crying on his dad's chest. Ugh, that broke me. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I do have one question with the script and it's more and with the movie and maybe you guys can explain this to me. Why was Oliver's mother either being scolded or kicked out of the art museum for what she was doing? I understood the whole part with like uh, when she was putting her head on the lady's shoulder. But yeah, that was like you're invading bubbles. 
we, we got to go. You're kind of embarrassing yourself. But the first time when she was kind of like shaping her body, like the piece of art and the guy comes up and he goes, uh, Mrs. So-and-so. And And it's like, well, what did she do? That was so bad. I wonder if, cause I know Hal worked at that art museum. I wonder if it was Hal like calling down and being like, look, she's making a scene of herself. She's like, I'm embarrassed for her. Get her out of here. Like, I wonder if there's a piece of that or possibly um, like alcoholism and she's behaving drunkenly in public. So we need to get her out of here. Remember it's the seventies or the sixties or the fifties. Yeah. Mm, Well, no, they they met alive. So yeah, sixties. I definitely felt just with the context clues of her body language felt a little bit more like alcoholism. That was the impression that I got from it. It's just, they never really alluded to anything like that. Anything else of that nature in the movie, like them talking about, yeah, mom drank or, you know. Yeah, but I don't know if they needed to. I think that it goes back to how you just perceive and interpret things. Um, And it it doesn't in a way that isn't like, I have to know what happened here. Um, It's more like a question and pondering just like you did. And if we're thinking about how Oliver maybe doesn't remember his parents' relationship remember those cues until after reflecting, like maybe he's looking back and being like, Oh, look how deeply sad my mom is. And here's the evidence I have of that based on her behavior at the art museum. Yeah. I I had that noted. I was, I think about halfway through when uh, the first scene where they were kind of like just sitting there and she's just staring off into space and looking very unhappy. And then she puts Oliver in his room and says, it's called catharsis. And um, <laughs> I, I I thought at that moment in the film, oh, she just found out that that he's gay. And because we later find out that, no, she knew about it even before they were married, that that he was gay. So that kind of threw out my theory. But I thought that the very beginning I was like, oh, she caught him or something like that happened. And now she's like, my life is empty. How about some happier relationships? Because. I think we need to talk about the romantic stuff. Yeah. Because I loved it. Mm -hmm. And this does go back to a lot of the writing. And I think from the little I know about Mike Mills, I do think a lot of his writing does come from real times in his his life. And I, I think about this whole laryngitis notebook conversation at the party. That feels like something that has happened. It didn't feel like someone was sitting in a room with a bunch of writers and was like, this is a bit, (laughs) you know, it felt like a real thing that happened or the whole driving in the car and uh, pointing Yeah. or ask me anything and someone saying, what's that over there? Oh, that's a tree or what's that over there? (laughs) You know, them having their first kiss where Anna is just squishing his face and messing up his hair and just completely losing her shit over it. It felt very authentic. And, and that's just talking about Oliver's relationship with Anna, like Christopher Plummer, Hal's relationship with Andy also felt incredibly genuine. There was so much joy there where they're lighting up fireworks and dancing and, They're sitting together in the hospital room drinking cheers to the nurses, you know? Mm -hmm. I think that speaks to how great the performances are in this movie too. Yeah. Uh, That, that these characters feel so lived in. I mean, Christopher Plummer won won an Oscar for this movie. So I think very, very deserved. I thought he did a phenomenal job with this character, especially the scene where he's getting the news from his doctor and Mike Mills does made the decision to keep the camera completely focused on plumber as you hear the doctor talking off screen. And I thought that was just a great decision to, to not cut off of his face because cutting away from that would show a lack of trust in your actor where he's like, no, I'm going to leave the camera on you, Chris. And you just, you just knock this out of the park. And he does for a young director to have that much trust in his actors. That, that says a lot. I have seen one other movie that Mike Mills has done, but I, I'm going to check out every movie he's ever done after this because he just feels so seasoned for being still a newer director. Mm-hmm. I don't even know what other movies he's done besides Thumbprint, 
What was Thumb it? Sucker. Thumb Sucker? He did one in 2021 called Come On, Come On with Joaquin Phoenix. And that's the oh. one of his I saw. And it was it was very good. Mm-hmm. Okay. Before we give our final thoughts on Beginners, Dylan, what did you think of the credits for this movie? <laughs> you know, from all of my years working at uh, movie theaters and working the Usher Shift, which was probably my favorite place to work because the concession stand stunk. You'd always smell like horrible popcorn and you'd sweat buckets. Tearing tickets, you just stood there the whole time. But uh, working as an usher is really fun because you get to hear a lot of music or this or that. And he, the credit music for this one, I really liked. Uh, I honestly, I wrote down that um, I probably would have been doing a little soft shoe as I was sweeping up the popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just kind of, you know, just flowing with the music a little bit. I thought, I think, you know, I'd always find myself doing that with, with stuff I really liked. And this one, I really enjoyed it. It wasn't uh, too boring or too long or anything like that. Awesome. And final thoughts on this movie from Emily. Wrap it up. I was telling Ben prior to recording that this has become a comfort movie for me. This is a movie that I would just put on and completely put everything down and just feel like a hug around my heart i really enjoyed this movie dylan i agree with with emily this uh this is a movie where i'll probably one night when the kids are put to bed all crystal and i'll have to sit and watch it this is one i really think that she would enjoy and she's not huge on a lot of these kind of movies but i really think that uh, this is one that we'd both really enjoy watching together yeah, this movie does an amazing job of presenting the way that we can distill who we are and like the sadness within us down to moments on reflection. I am the way I am because of this event or this relationship or this conversation. This movie is why I watch movies, not just to be entertained or as a form of escape to like, but to like reflect on myself and the human condition and the world around me. I can totally understand why someone may not like this movie because maybe they don't watch movies with the same purpose. Or if you found this movie to be pretentious for me though, this film is perfect and it's one that I'm going to continue to watch over and over again. It's going to be one of my go-to I'm feeling sad movies, put it on and just allow the feelings. And I'm, I'm prepared to fight Emily for this at, on the end of the year list, I think. I'm ready to oh, go. Oh, I'm going to punch you in the face. <laughs> this is not a never let me go situation. This is a, I'm going to claw your face off. <laughs> Bring it. Games, 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 games. What's your favorite idea? Mine is being creative. How do you get that idea? I just try to think creatively. Here we go. Let's do some Twits Light. You got something to write with? I do. Okay. Take a few seconds to write down three directions slash places you would point if your co-host was driving. The funnier, the better. Three directions or places. Yep. I have, I have no idea if I did this right or not. <laughs> okay. I, I, I truly have no idea what to expect with what we're doing here. I'm excited. This is my first question. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. Number one, tell your co-host where you would point as you were driving with them. Well, the first place I would point is up. <laughs> that sounds exactly like what you would do. Yeah. <laughs> the second place I would point would be at an IHOP. Nice. And then the nice. last place I would point would be at my butt. <laughs> Dylan, do those sound like places Ben would point if you were driving? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thing is, though, it probably would be his bare butt and not uh, <laughs> and not just him pointing at his pants. Full on moon. <laughs> no, I would be sitting, kneeling in the seat, facing the back, no pants on, butt in the air, just pointing <laughs> my butt. You go to my butt. <laughs> <laughs> Who's got two thumbs? I want you to drive here. <laughs> <laughs> Dylan, what about you? Oh, I'm going to ruin it again, as as always, because I'm going to get... 
sentimental. <laughs> Jesus. I'm sorry. First place I would go, I would direct uh, him. I'd direct Ben to take me to the Rosemount movie theater so we can go see a movie. Because we haven't gone to see a movie in a while. Oh. And I like going to see movies with Ben. Uh, another uh, good place that I would want to direct him to go uh, would be to Perkins. Because we would have the tradition of always going to Perkins before going to the Best Picture Showcase uh, every year. And and then we end at your butt. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> and honestly, the last one I put in there, uh, I direct him to tra- take me to Trader Joe's. Because uh, I'd want to get some cookies and gummies. That you makes sense. Goddamn Trader Joe's cookies, I swear. They're so good. <laughs> Yeah, Number good. two. Okay, so you guys are at a Halloween costume party. Yep. And you have laryngitis, but you have a notepad. What's your pickup line at the Halloween costume party? Keep in mind, I think Anna's was something about her dead parents. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mine would be, uh, my throat is sore. Can I make your throat sore? <laughs> <laughs> And then it would just be a picture of a penis. <laughs> <laughs> w- would you have a little like a number next to an uh, inches or uh, uh, or anything next to that with a little arrow or anything? No, I would. I would just let the penis speak for itself. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Your drawing skills are that that good. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'd probably write down like. You're so beautiful that the second I saw you, I went speechless. Oh. oh. Well, one of ours is working. <laughs> so, Emily, what are, what are you doing after the show? <laughs> <laughs> all right, number three. <laughs> <laughs> We've all had pets. I want you to narrate a conversation of what your dog says to you on either a regular basis or just like a general conversation that has happened or would happen. I'm fairly certain my dog is an idiot. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So I think he would just be constantly asking a barrage of questions like like a child would, where he's like, what's that? What does that do? Yeah, but why? Why? (laughs) And I would just be so frustrated with him. Just like I am now with how often he barks at me. I would have conversations kind of with my uh, French bulldog when I had her. And it was more just like, it was just general conversation, you know, and she would kind of talk like this. You know, I'm cute. I'm cuddly. Love me. (laughs) And uh, when she You use that same voice for your children before they can talk. (laughs) <laughs> I'm Daniel. I'm cute. I'm cuddly. <laughs> now let's all agree to never be creative again. Thanks, Emily, for those questions. Yeah, that was good. For our game today, we're going to play another iteration of Poor Emily. Oh, uh, I'm going to put in the chat something for Dylan to look at. Dylan, go ahead and click on that link. I've come up with eight beginner movie questions. <laughs> These are beginner movie trivia questions. <laughs> Who says? You? Well, I legitimately looked up beginning movie trivia and then picked the ones that I thought would be the most interesting or ones that I thought people should actually know. Dylan, look at those eight questions, and I want you to write down how many you think Emily will answer correctly. <laughs> oh, fun. I don't want you to tell us how many you think she'll get it right. Just write it down. All right. All right. And again, these are questions I feel most people might have a chance of getting correct. Oh, my God. Eight questions, Emily. Are you ready? So ready. Okay. Number one. After which movie did the sale of pet rats increase dramatically? Ratatouille? That is correct. Shit, yeah. Yeah. Number two, who was the only actor who received an Oscar nomination for Lord of the Rings? I really should know this. Um, Ian McKellen? That's correct. Way to go. Question three. Andy Serkis probably should have. I agree. 
especially for two towers. Number three, which franchise has over 24 minutes of just staring in it? Oh, my God. Um, honestly, I kind of want to say there will be blood. <laughs> well, it's, a, it's a movie franchise, so it's more than one movie. Like oh, movie and its okay. sequels. Um, that is really funny, though, because there's a lot of staring and there will be blood. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of long pauses. A franchise. You know what? Let's go to Harry Potter because there's eight movies and maybe there's that much time. <laughs> that's good reasoning. It's actually Twilight. That was my other guess. I was like, that's four movies. Shut. Five movies. <laughs> oh, God. Seriously? Yeah, because they broke up Breaking Dawn into two. Oh, that's right. Yeah. I forgot about that. For no no question reason. four. What movie was incorrectly announced as the winner of Best Picture in 2017? La La Land. Correct. The only reason I know that is because there were so many memes about it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only reason. Were you on Reddit when you when you saw that stuff? Is that where you got that? Reddit? Not for Reddit. Yeah. Street. Okay. Reddit is <laughs> so great. What's the disdain for Reddit in your voice? I don't I don't get it. I don't know. <laughs> Do you not like Reddit? I know. Are you mad that she told you to go on Reddit to find manga answers from earlier? <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Question five. What was the first feature length animated movie ever released? I have a feeling it's Snow White, but I feel like that's wrong. So I'm just going to go with Snow White because I don't know. It is Snow White. That's correct. No fucking way. I am crushing these yep. beginner level <laughs> trivia questions. <laughs> and it was given a specialty Oscar, too. Ooh. Number six, Tom Hanks won Best Actor two years in a row. One of them was for Forrest Gump. What was the other movie? Uh, the one where there's a volleyball in it? I don't know the name of it. <laughs> yeah, that movie's called Castaway, and that is not correct. Okay, cool. I got one it wrong. Was what is Philadelphia. it? Philadelphia. I've never heard of it. I love that movie. <laughs> Question seven. Which was the first movie to go to VHS while still being in theaters and won 11 Oscars? Oh, my God. What? Yep. Um, mm -hmm. I have no fucking clue. I'm going to go with Star Wars because I don't know. Do I have to be specific about which one? Uh, no, because Star Wars is not correct. Fuck. <laughs> it is Titanic. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. I hate that movie. I haven't even seen it. <laughs> and the last question, number eight, in the Matrix, does Neo take the blue pill or the red pill? Oh, fuck me. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> I intentionally picked movie questions for movies I knew you kind of liked or at least were aware of for the most part. Except for Philadelphia. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, he takes the blue pill. He takes the red pill. Fuck off! <laughs> Come on, can't you remember the line from the movie where he goes, why, oh, why didn't I take the blue pill? I was literally <laughs> saying it in my head, but I just... <clears throat> Dylan, hold up your number. How many did you think Emily was going to get right? Three. <laughs> I and got she four got, right. <laughs> she got four right. Dylan, the, the stipulation I set up before is that if you were within one question... You were the winner and you <gasps> were within one question. So you go ahead and <sighs> win this week. And Emily Woo. is our loser. I but em four is really good, Emily. I'm very proud of you for getting four. That's that's How a win. Did you in think itself. I was actually going to get right? <laughs> Got 50 <laughs> percent. I was going to write down two. Two would have been my guess. <laughs> See, Emily, I have way more. I have much more faith in you. I forgot about how memeable that La La Land moment was. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, thank you, everyone, for listening. Please like, rate, subscribe, share us with a friend or two. Follow us on social media at IDYP underscore podcast on Twitter and Instagram. Or you can email us at idrinkyourpodcast at gmail.com. Emily, since you lost this week, you get to end the episode with uh, the saying that was chosen for today. 
So end the episode by saying, are we married yet? Woof, 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 woof. <laughs> ah, yes. Subtitle. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Yeah, for a visual show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good night, Bye. All.